thank you for joining us at the third annual The Lofts Wordplay Book Festival. I'm Steph Opitz, the founding director of the festival, and I'm thrilled to be here with you all today. Virtual Wordplay is a presentation of St. Catharines University and the Star Tribune. And this event is co-presented by our friends Literary Arts in Portland, Oregon, Black Mountain Institute in Las Vegas, and the Wisconsin Book Festival in Madison. Um, all four festivals are huge fans of the authors joining us today, so we're thrilled to be able to present this together. Um, the Loft acknowledges that the state of Minnesota is located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of Indigenous people. The Loft and Open Book are built within the homelands of the Dakota people. The Loft recognizes the original peoples of this place and affirm tribal sovereignty. A few housekeeping items well, uh, before we get started. If you have questions for Helen or Kathy, you can um, click the ask a question link and type it in there and we'll try to get it to them. Um, this, oh, and there's, at, there's a link right by there too where you can buy books. Please support our authors. Please buy Helen's latest book. Um, it's a big part of what we do at The Loft is supporting that ecosystem of reading. And while you're there, uh, you can consider donating some money to The Loft while all the wordplay events are free. We'd love your support in bringing great authors into your life for years to come. And please, 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 please take the evaluation um, that you'll receive at the end of the session for via email. That would be uh, really helpful for us. It is my great pleasure to introduce your moderator today, Catherine Chung. Uh, Kathy is the recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, um, and a director's visitor visitorship at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. She was a grant a new voice and, and won an honorable mention for the Penn Hemingway, Penn Hemingway Award for her first novel, Forgotten Country. Uh, her second novel, The Tenth Muse, came out in 2019 to wide critical acclaim. I count myself among the critics who loved that book and consider it a favorite. So it's my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Kathy Chung, who will now introduce her dear friend. Thank you for joining us today, Kathy. Thank you so much, Steph. Um, so Helen Oyayemi is the author of eight books, including Gingerbread, What Is Not Yours Is Not Yours, Mr. Fox, and most recently, Pieces, which she will read from today. She has won the Pen Open Book Award, the Somerset Mom Award, a Hurston Wright Legacy Award, and she was also named one of Granta's best young British novelists. She's been called a genius and one of the best English language authors in the world today. And as her friend and devoted fan, I can confirm that there is no one more delightfully inventive to read or have a conversation with. So I encourage everyone in the audience to ask questions, um, which we'll cover in the Q&A portion of the event while you have the chance today. Um, so let's give it up for Helen. She's gonna read. I will totally be applauding. Hello, Kathy. <laughs> I am your hugely devoted fan as well. Yay, I'm happy to be talking to you. But I think, I hope this doesn't make any trouble, but I was hoping to read from another book and not from pieces. <laughs> but we'll see how oh, it goes. So, yeah. so this is my hear me out. Um, <laughs> I've been rereading The Man Who Is Thursday by um, G.K. Chesterton, this novel that I absolutely love. It's a 20th century novel. And I've been going around asking people if they've read it and they say no. And I'm like, no, everyone should read it. But I think that it's very pertinent because in the opening, there's a lot of talk about trains. And it just reminded me of what, I think what I hoped, the kind of atmosphere I hoped I could generate when I was writing pieces. Um, but anyway, it's an exchange in a garden in London between an anarchist poet and a poet of order who's also a secret policeman and there's oh, just something yeah. so intriguing about this <laughs> there's something so intriguing about this exchange so the poet of order says why do all the clerks and navvies in the railway trains look so sad and tired so very sad and tired i will tell you it's because they know that the train is going right it is because they know that whatever place they have taken a ticket for that place they will reach it's because after they have passed Sloan Square, they know that the next station must be Victoria and nothing but Victoria. Oh, their wild rapture. Oh, their eyes like stars and their souls again in Eden. If the next station were unaccountably Baker Street. And then the poet of order replies, I tell you, went on Simon with passion, that every time a train comes in, I feel that it has broken past batteries of besiegers 
and that man has won a battle against chaos. You say contemptuously that when one has left Sloan Square, one must come to Victoria. I say that one might do a thousand things instead, and that whenever I really come there, I have the sense of hairbreadth escape. And when I hear the guard shout out the word Victoria, it's not an unmeaning word. It is to me the cry of a herald announcing conquest. It is to me indeed, Victoria, it's the victory of Adam. And then the poet of anarchy replies thusly, Gregory wagged his heavy red head with a slow and sad smile. And even then, he said, we poets always ask the question, and what is Victoria now that you have got there? That's, the, that's what I wanted to read to you. And that's how I feel like, this whole sense of a destination, sense of arriving, what does it all mean? Is it even relevant? Is it possible to have a journey and a story that doesn't center itself on either of those things? And that was sort of my point of departure. Do I still have to read one piece? <laughs> you don't, you don't. And I love, um, I love what you read actually, even though it obliterated the first question I was gonna ask you. Um, which was all about trains. And I would just like to also point out for the audience that we are indeed on a train journey. Um, Helen is aboard a luxury train uh, that runs through Tokyo. And I, I think I'm on a train that runs through South Africa. These are our, our backgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's so interesting the bit that you read because as you were reading, I thought um, it's so like you, um, or, or when I think of um, both your work and just uh, the experience of having conversations with you, I think about how often there is a kind of um, back and forth or even a, a kind of argument about not just, um, not just how people see things, but even what the argument itself is about. Um, and it was, it was something that was like very clear in the whole novel. Like even, I was thinking about how you have this tendency for me to defamiliarize things, right? That, that in general, when we have conversations with people, we think that we're all talking about the same thing, um, right? And, and so there are certain, like when we think family, we think family is constituted in a certain way. And in your book, um, you know, the families that you describe are not what we necessarily think of as families or there are fake families or fake parents um, or different sort of configurations of families. Um, and so I was thinking about this idea of defamiliarization and see, I've started too big now, Helen. I had these, these tiny questions I was going to ask you and then you gave this reading and I'm just thinking out loud, but um, I was thinking I about this idea of, Oops. yes, I know I, you like to destabilize me. It's, it's a, and, and I think in your work, you like to destabilize things, right? Um, but I was thinking about this idea of defamiliarization and the way that it actually makes you have to be sort of more precise. Right, like Otto and Xavier, the couple are on their honeymoon, but it's not really a honeymoon, um, and they're not really married. But you know, one of them has taken another person's surname, and so there's the exact nature of their relationship. But something about it makes you think about what is marriage, right? And and what is a honeymoon, and what is it meant to accomplish? Um, and sort of the other idea I was thinking about, in kind of opposition to it, and. <clears throat> it's very hard. I was thinking how this conversation would be very hard for me to have with you because I feel like I'll just be throwing around words in this very crude way when you are actually so sort of like delicate and particular about the way that you define things. But um, I, the other idea... Well, I actually um, think that you're one of the most precise thinkers that I know and that maybe that's why we always have these conversations where we don't, we never talk about the obvious things but we end up like getting into intricacies <laughs> and, and it's... It's fine, but anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. But, but the other thing, so I was thinking about defamiliarization and the way that it makes you see things differently um, as opposed to this idea of unseeing, um, mm. which, which is this other thing that happens throughout the book. And um, it's a very long way to leading me to this question of, can, can you also talk about the entry of this idea of unseeing? Um. So I suppose I have to come to um, Leonora Carrington and this one sentence of hers that she has, well, she always says great things. Like she says that the way to look at life is one eye to the telescope and one eye to the microscope. So that's like one way, like two ways of seeing at once. And she like loves to write like that. And I love to read her like that as well. But she also says, 
I think in one sentence, she has this really um, excellent memoir about um, losing her mind. She just actually had a summer where she just, she felt like she disappeared or that something really strange happened to her and then suddenly she came back. So there was that kind of as if someone had snapped their fingers and she snuffed out and then suddenly she came back. And so it was her trying to retrace where she might have been. Um, but she talks about trying to rid her vision of images that have made her blind. And I kind of feel like that, I, I think unseeing is sort of like that. It's a, it's not necessarily a process of erasing what's around you, but it's a process of stripping away everything that is an assumption or um, everything that doesn't operate on a case by case basis, um, which is sort of how I go through the world with individuals as well. Like I never, I feel like I've never met anyone or been in a place and thought, oh, I know what this is. <laughs> it's always, it's always, what is this? <laughs> And it might not be, it might not be what's in my experience. And, and also I just, maybe I just have a really bad memory where I don't really remember what my experience is. So I'm always having to renew it. Um, and also a combination of being physically very short-sighted and genuinely not knowing what's going on in that sense as well. So like, I feel like there are lots of um, philosophical, but also actual practical ways that, that I'm always having to consider this this frame of um, thought. I don't remember if you remember this conversation that we had when I had LASIK eye surgery, <clears throat> or if you're gonna, as it turns out, remember it completely differently. Um, which, always <laughs> which always happens. But I remember when I got LASIK eye surgery, um, I called you and I said, oh my God, Helen, you can't believe how just clear the world looks. I didn't even know that like leaves were articulated, you know, that, that they were so individually articulated. And I remember I you responded, Yes, you said, yeah. oh my God, no. I never want to see anything like that. Um, no. And I just thought- that I, was I like, I put my glasses on when I'm in a gallery or at the cinema, but otherwise I just sort of like things to be fuzzy. And you, yes, you, you, and have, you have surprises, it's just nice. Like I just like it. <laughs> yes, it, it made me, I think about it all the time actually when I read you, how you see things I think differently because of like physically the way that you see things. Um, but also that that fuzziness of your vision has always, I think, led you and, and not just the, the physical seeing, I, I feel like has always led you to be very kind to me in a way that I appreciate. I'm always like, oh, Helen sees me in this particularly blurry way that is that is good for me. Because the other story that I told you is that after I had LASIK eye surgery, I looked in the mirror and I was like, oh my God, it's too, it's like too much truth. Um, but that said, it, um, I, I no, like it. I see you very close up. I mean, that's a good thing about being friends with people. You get to like be close to them in ways that you can't be with strangers. So I've seen mm. you very close up and I know that it's mm. good with you, so. I, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I also, um, I like this, I like this word that you use, fuzzy, you know, that you see things in a fuzzy way because actually right before I signed on to talk to you, I was thinking about this term called fuzzy logic, which I meant to look up but then didn't, which means that I'm probably going to butcher the definition. Um, but, you know, my, my rice maker runs on fuzzy logic. And it's um, instead of going at a, at a specific temperature, it just kind of adjusts all the time in this fuzzy way. So it doesn't maintain a single temperature. But by being fuzzy, it kind of gets to the, to the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about how there is also like a, there's always like when I read you a, a sort of multiplicity of meanings. Um, of, of words and scenarios and relationships that I think um, is, is fuzzy in your work, but that the fuzziness isn't imprecise. You know, the, the fuzziness, I think, um, actually just describes the world, which is also fuzzy. Um, and I, yeah, and I wondered if, um, actually, I didn't add that, it's just like a random comment that I made that now I'm gonna pretend I'm turning into a question. But when you said yes. that you see the, yeah, actually, I think, and I think that that's maybe why, I think it's one of the reasons why I can't be a poet, actually, because I think that you need to, in order to write poetry, you maybe have to, like, see very straight and clear and direct and, and also have control over the meanings of your work. Like, even if there are multiple meanings, I think you have to know what they are or to, like, shape them in a certain way, whereas I... I think I'm more commit, interested maybe. in misunderstandings yeah. and in the in the things that are actually wrong and like things that I didn't grasp and like allowing those into the space as well because I think that they are 
real too and not unimportant as well um mm -hmm. so yeah I think that that's why that's why I'm in prose like I always like think very wistfully and en enviously of poetry but it's just not ultimately I think it's just not what I'm interested in doing mm -hmm. um when telling a story um there's so there's a quote in your book um where Otto and Xavier are, are talking to um these two other people on the train, Allegra and Bora, and um, they're talking about a sanity test that somebody is, is going to have to take. And um, I think Xavier asks the women, he says, hold on, I wrote it down. Um, he, sa he asks them basically if sanity depends on um, consistency of perception. Mm -hmm. and, they both, and they both say yes. So um, I, I wonder, I, I wonder what you, your thoughts are on that or if you can talk about it. I mean, it, I, I'm thinking about it because of this idea of fuzziness versus this consistency of perception or what sanity is or what reality is if, um, if the way that you see it is a little bit fuzzier and not a singular thing. Um, it's interesting because I think that personally for me, the true answer to that question would have been no. <laughs> and and actually, yes, I thought. Right, I, I would, but I, and also in an in the first draft I wrote, one of them answered no and the other one answered yes, actually. But then for some reason I went back and and made them both say yes or had them both say yes, or that's what I heard them saying. Um no, for me, I think for me, I think it's no, but also there was something revealing about the way that they were on the both the, on the, they were both on the same side of that debate. And actually I think it then started to give me an indication of what sort of train Otto and Xavier were on and what sort of people they were keeping company with and actually how the ways in which we tried to like force, um, force consistency, force consensus, create a kind of insanity of their own. Um, so it was just, it sort of added something to the atmosphere to have that definite line drawn between sane and insane because generally I don't think it's possible to draw that line at mm -hmm. any time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, when I read that, I thought, oh, Helen doesn't believe that that is true. Um, and I, I felt actually throughout the book that there were all these little sort of tricks um, that were placed in the book. Um, earlier, you said that you don't meet people and think of them as a type of person. But in the book, um, Otto and Xavier are talking. And I think Xavier says, you know, he's like a character on Dawson's Creek. And um, I think that Otto tells him he's Joey and then claims Pacey for himself and um, Xavier says no no you're Dawson just li basically like, live with it right and um, what I actually I loved about that exchange was them sort of defining each other right and and when one defines himself being corrected um, but also this I what I really liked was the way in which they automatically organize themselves into archetypes um, mm -hmm. and so I don't know where I'm going to go with this question, but I was curious um, because I found myself actually doing that when I was reading your book. Like I, I felt allegiances with certain characters um, or um, I guess I identified with certain characters, but then my allegiances shifted. And I wondered what your relationship to the characters was when you were, when you were writing it. Um, if there were people that you identified with more or less, if, um, if your mm -hmm. understanding of them changed or if they mm -hmm. did your bidding. Um, I try. I tried my best to get them to, <laughs> to do my bidding, but it didn't really work. I think that there was a point They're when yours. I wanted to get quite thrillery, but like nobody would panic in the way that they would in a thriller. It was just more sort of, oh no, this happened. Let's have some snacks. And so, <laughs> so then I was like, oh, okay, I, this is the kind of story it's going to be. Um, I probably identified most closely with Otto, but I don't know if that was just because I had to. Um, just to write most of the book is from his perspective and so I had to sort of pin myself very closely to the way he was but then also I don't know maybe we're both um, diehard romantics with a with a sort of veneer of cynicism and sort of like I don't care about this but really caring very very much um, <laughs> so so that but um, in general so Kathy I'm reading this book that makes me so happy it's called it's called Three Bags Full, and it's a murder mystery, and the detectives are a flock of sheep. And 
I just can't. And the, and the lead investigator is called Miss Maple. And basically every sheep in the flock I, I identify with, but there's one that I identify with the most, the most, and it's this lamb called the winter lamb. It was born in winter, and then all of the other sheep like keep telling it that like it's wrong and it shouldn't, it shouldn't have come <laughs> to the flock. And the, and then the winter lamb's just like running around like stealing milk where it can, and it's just very, um, it's just decided to live. It was born at the wrong time, but it's decided to live, and I feel that's how I feel about myself: born at the wrong time, but decided to live anyway. Um, I think it's it's kind of easy, and also in a lot of books that I read. I tend to identify with characters that are animals the most. Like there's this tortoise called the Sesmenegar in the Time Regulation Institute, who's always trying to get out of the story. Like whenever whenever the narrator describes him, he's like always scrabbling at him. He doesn't want to be like captured in words. And I don't know why that is the case, um, but it's always like the non-human character, mm-hmm. except except in, in pieces that means you think I would identify with Arthur and Chela, but I didn't really. I feel like they're, um, they're kind of traditional I've tried in two lines always. Yeah, you know, so the character that I tried very hard not to identify with, but felt myself, unfortunately and sadly, identifying with was Premisil. Um, oh, really? Yeah, he's, yes, I really did. Good. I'm, I'm actually I, glad that you said that because, yeah, anyway, continue. Because you want me to feel invisible and misunderstood. No, and, I don't. Um, <laughs> And and no, creepy because, in this very no, well meaning people like pleasing he's way. The character, he's the character that I think is quite beautiful in his indeterminacy. But everyone is sort of like, oh, he's so frightening in his indeterminacy. Like, what is premise or what are his motives? And like, why do we have to like read read darkness into him? Like, why can't he just be a lot of things and and why why do they have to try and fix him into one form? I feel like it would be, I feel like he wouldn't be as scary if everyone wasn't trying so hard to like create a single narrative for him. And I feel like his scariness also comes from the fact that everybody's like used him in their, in various ways. You know, everybody has taken something from him um, and then pretend that he doesn't exist because he is, I guess, indeterminate. Um, I feel like now I'm accidentally revealing more about myself than, than I mean to, and, and I'm not even sure that I believe well, these I things about myself. I think you just, there's something special about having empathy for fictional characters. I like it. I think it's good. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, what else did I want to talk? Oh, yes. Um, so, it was also funny because I feel like I'm asking you all these questions as if they're straight questions and then you're just going to going to take them this way, but um, there was this description of how people watch marionette shows that I really loved, um, where, and you say, I think that some people watch the puppet master, some people watch the action that's happening, um, and some people watch just the strings, um, and I really like the way that you sort of broke down um, how people can experience things using, like, just one filter, right, like, as, as their primary filter, and I guess I was curious um, when you are writing or reading a story, is, is there a filter, like your go-to filter through which you see, um, through which you, you see stories? Otto, um, the guy you said that you identified with most, said of course I'm the one that's watching the audience members, um, mm-hmm. which I thought was really lovely, but I was- um, No, it's true. I think that when I, especially at puppet shows, um, I'm always watching the audience. <laughs> Um, it's just a sort of default thing and I'm not I don't even know what exactly it is I'm looking for but Mm -hmm. it's like that the Emily Dickinson poem the show is not the show but they that go um just kind of maybe there's an there's an honesty or like an unguardedness um in people when they are when their attention is focused on something else and it feels like my only chance to see some aspect of them that they would otherwise um, try to conceal, maybe. And now I start to sound really creepy, like I'm sitting in the audience, just like watching people's faces closely, but. <laughs> I'm know, glad that chance. you're you're joining me in the creepy train with, yes. <laughs> no, but it's true, a lot of the time I feel like, um, do you do this, like, so I, I Google things like, what do normal people have in their fridges? <laughs> I feel like I'm always studying like what normal people do or like what humans do as if I'm not not one of them or us or whatever. Um, 
could be a neurotype. I actually, I actually love that. And I believe it because there's, um, when I was reading your book, I was thinking about how even handedly you treat everybody actually. And I thought there's like a, there's like a real sort of like anthropological, I think, attitude towards them and like no judgment. Whereas I think that I'm totally partisan, you know, I had allegiances and I was like, oh my God. Um, but I totally believe that you Google that. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I was once at a residency, um, we were having like an open studio where people come and like, look at your work and, um, you know, writers never have anything to show, but, um, I, <laughs> Before they came, I had Googled, um, how do you know if you're going crazy to return to our conversation about sanity? And then one of the people who was at the open studio asked if he could look something up on the computer. And I said, sure. And I handed him my computer and he looked up whatever he looked up. And we've been having this very nice conversation. And then he like kind of rushed out of there without saying anything. And then when I looked at my computer, that was what was on the search function. I how did. do you know? If you're going crazy yeah and do you remember what the search results were like whether were there any like tips and advice no i think that often google results are not helpful or definitive in that way yeah. um Sad. yeah but um you know i think that your book in some ways made some answers to that question which i did not mean to bring up of how do you know if you're going crazy like i was really interested i guess in the you know, I was curious because there's there's this person and this question of her sanity because she doesn't see somebody, right? She's sort of unseeing them or doesn't see them. Um, mm -hmm. And I wondered what constitutes sanity? Um, you know, like setting aside the idea of like a consistency of perception, um, but also I was curious, like what is, is it a consistency, like an individual consistency in which like you just perceive things the same way? Um, or is it other people consistently perceiving alongside you? You know, so I was curious about this, this but then the I thing. thought like. I feel, I feel like it's a group concept. Like it's, it's about buying into um, a general and more general reality. Like that's how, that's how yeah. I conceive of it. And I think that that's why Prem and Ava, like actually in not being able to see him, like causes so much trouble by like just mm -hmm. suddenly making everyone realize that actually they're on their own in their perceptions and and then they don't know what to do and then everything just starts to fall apart from there. Yeah, and I was, I guess what I was most impressed by with Ava is just her conviction somehow. You know, I, I feel like everybody else has self-doubt, but Ava, I mean, kind of, but really, um, you know, when she's walking around like not seeing people, it's, it's, it's sort of chilling and incredible. Um, but I was, I guess I was also thinking about this idea of group consensus um, and how, if it applies to sanity, um, does it also reply, apply then to reality, right? Like is reality mm -hmm. sort of a, a group construct that we arrive by um, through consensus? Mm, I don't think it is. I think, I think things are real that are not um, acknowledged by the group and that is, an issue. <laughs> it, it, it seems that maybe there's also a consensus to just not talk about those things that, um, that some of us, some of us see and others of us don't. Um, and then the things, that's how the things end up taking on a really kind of violent life of their own um, in a lot of ways. And, and then also like making certain people act to defend it and other people's and other people act against it. And like, you just become like proxies of this thing that is in dispute over whether it's real or not. And uh... Yeah, which I think, um, yeah, I, I thought a lot about that actually when I was reading your book, like these different realities. Um, see, and here I am being imprecise maybe, these different perceptions of reality that, I, that we mm -hmm. all have, right? And, the way, and what happens when they clash, I guess. And I think the degree to which I was um, sympathetic to Prem was actually because I felt like everybody took Ava's side, um, even, even though they could see him. Um, right. Um, you know, I think they were just afraid. Like, I actually don't know. It was, it was interesting to me with Ava as a character, because like you said, she's so sure and she's just sort of like, no, I don't see anything. But then part of me was wondering if she does see it. Like, I just felt like, is she trolling me everyone? Like, what too. is me happening too. with Ava? Like, it was very... I thought I, she's maybe the most inscrutable character to me because it was... I don't know. I think if, if everyone was saying to me that they could see someone and I couldn't, I think I'd be more panicked than she was, where she was just kind of like, I just can't see him, but 
okay, you guys can. <laughs> maybe maybe that's tolerance. Maybe that's the model of of tolerance that we need in society. I don't I don't know. Um. I felt like she frightened me. Um, or like mm. if I had to um, if I had to choose like a kind of person that I would say I don't. Th there's something about the way that everybody fell into line with her that I found really chilling, I guess, you know, and I thought like, oh, is that the power of conviction? You know, mm -hmm. is, is it just that she is more sure than everybody else? Um, but I agree with you that it, I wasn't, it didn't, I wasn't certain that it wasn't a choice on her part. Um, you know, and there's the, that crazy letter that she writes to our Pandy where sh she like, um, mangled her name at every turn, um, which I just thought was like a was an act of violence, really. You right. know, she's, um, she's capable undertaken. of taking control of um, of actually someone else's concept of of reality, and you know, I think that's very attractive for Allegra, like her partner. <laughs> for everyone else, yeah. it's like really scary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is really scary. Um, okay. Um, can we talk about the paintings that Prem makes? He, so he makes these white paintings um, that look like people can't see. Ugh, I, so people think that they can't see anything but white, but then when they start describing them, they suddenly realize that there are all these images. Um, mm. and, I, and I loved it and I wondered where, you know, what you were thinking about or what you were looking at or what. Mm. I think it's what I'm, I'm starting to wonder how I can, how like I personally can practice literature as an art, like an actual, like art with a capital A, as a visual art even, like arrangement of particular arrangements of words and sentences and the effects that that can create. And is there any way in which a book or a story can be a language painting, if that makes any sense. Um, and it's kind of what um, Carol and later Xavier, when he writes that book that's not his own book, are thinking about when they when they talk about this priest who tried to create um, a harpsichord that could allow people to see sound. It's about it's it's basically just which for me, I think maybe art is just trying to do the impossible. In fact, only being satisfied with an attempt at the impossible. Um, and then obviously like breaking yourself against the limitations and then like getting up and trying again. Um, but it's something that Prem in his coming from his indeterminate place, maybe only someone like Prem um, could actually make happen. That you look at a white space and you begin talking about it and you find the image in it through words rather than through vision. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or the way that you realize um, once you start talking about it that you have actually taken in all this stuff that you hadn't realized you'd taken in until you started talking about it. It, it actually, I felt like there was a real similarity in the art or that you described. Or it's as if there's another spectator inside you that you're not even aware of, mm -hmm, like who takes mm -hmm. over when you start to describe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And like the distance between the, the part of you that understands something and the part of you that is blind, like that those two things exist simultaneously. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, you know, the other day I, I texted you after I, I read your book and said, I love it so much. Um, and it reminds me of a kind of magic that I feel when we're together. And you said, um, <clears throat> Kathy, I'm, I'm beginning to despise that word. Um, but I've, I've been thinking about it and I, I wondered if you would be up for a conversation about what the word magic. Kathy, why? <laughs> because I've been thinking about it, because I've been thinking about it, but but maybe, okay, so mm -hmm. maybe we can move over. I, I knew you would be here. No, we can I, I mean, if you've been thinking about it, thought, then we should talk about it. <laughs> and I thought also, you know, we can, um, I'll fall on the sword and um, it won't happen in the Q&A now can just blame me for this irritating, tedious conversation that I'm going to now um, make us embark on. You know, we are we are locked into our train compartments. We have to just, we are. I think, ride out this journey. But I, you know, I, I remember really... you told me that riddle when we were going to Kalavi Barry in a train carriage. And I think that I was actually so charmed by that riddle that I forgot the answer to it. <laughs> It was one of those things where later when I was trying to tell somebody else and then they were like, I don't know how to answer this. What's the answer? And I was like, I actually don't 
No, <laughs> even though you told me. <laughs> but there was something about that train carriage and the wheels moving and the atmosphere of like going somewhere but being in the same, being fixed at the same time. I know. But now, now we're here in a train carriage talking about magic. I know, and it's terrible because I always think of you as like the perfect um, companion on a on a train trip, and I think that I'm probably going to ruin it now. But it's okay um, because I <clears throat> have faith that you'll forgive me. Um, we don't actually have to talk about magic. I was actually thinking about reality, um, and like as opposed to magic, and how I think often we. But use why is it word... opposed to magic? Like, why why do we have why is this para- why does this paradigm even exist? So I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm, I'm not, don't worry. I'm not, but so, but yes, I was thinking about why this paradigm exists, but I was also thinking about when people use it to apply to things, right? Um, and you had said in, in the same text, um, you had said something like, why do people always think I'm talking about other worlds when I'm just talking about this, this world? Um, and so I thought, yes, of course, you know, like it's, but I, but it feels like, um, and maybe what I was thinking was, it feels like either a willful or an unconscious, I'm not sure, like misunderstanding of what's going on, because of course people are invisible to one another all of the time, right? And, and of course, you know, like all these things that might seem magical, and right. of course there are people who have no documentation to prove that they exist, right? And, and of course that is actually yes. just a reality, um, mm-hmm. also for the record, when I said, I think of there being a kind of magic between us, I was not referring to this other kind of magic, but, but why, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and so I was thinking about that impulse to call something magical, like in the moment when you're actually referring to something that is so specific and absolutely real, like, you, and, right. and so um, and so like one, I thought, I'm sure this is why you are irritated when people say otherworldly and magical. Um, but two, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious about that move, I guess. Um, and I guess I'm gonna also propose that maybe uh, you should think you're doing something right when people wanna call it magic, <laughs> because even though they're not along for the ride, I feel like that impulse to say like, oh, this isn't the world means that you hit a nerve somewhere, right? That, that we're all kind of like, that the people are rallying around a certain vision of the world as if it's reality. Mm-hmm. And, and you've pointed out this spot where we're wrong. I don't think that, yeah. okay. So I think that my issue with such terms is that they feel like a gesture of like pushing something away or like, but, but like in a nice way, like, oh, this is, but it's not, <laughs> you know, it's not oh, really yeah. what's going on. I'm like, but it is really what's going on. So, so would why, you prefer it if it were hostile? Um, I, yeah, I find it more yeah. bracing in some way or just not necessarily honest, but I would, I would be able to understand what it is and I would not feel sad about it. Whereas there's something about, Uh, like somebody reading a newspaper oh there's the Wilkie Collins there's a Wilkie Collins story called the haunted hotel where somebody is like afflicted by um a condition of the mind where she thinks that everything that has happened in her life was in story and it's kind of like that it's just that kind of where she's very divided from her actual self like in a really really sad way like so she talks about everything that's happened to her as if it happened to somebody else in a book or in a story long long ago and far away and it's like I'm not talking about long ago and far away though like that's not actually and it's um it, it makes me feel crazy like it, it comes it comes down to that um consensus reality is consensus um yeah. sanity is yeah. consensus it makes me feel excluded from what's actually going on when I'm actually describing things as I see them and as I know them and so and, and I when don't it's your own how... book yeah when it's like right. people are um, using your own book to divide you from yeah yeah and it's kind of yeah. and it's also sort of like being accused of a crime like I feel like I commit so many crimes in what I write and I'm always accused of ones that I haven't committed <laughs> I just want to be accused of the, of the ones that I am committing um yeah. I feel like I throw so much into into what I write and then it's all just there's that gentle dismissal of the oh the magical or the whimsical or the whatever and it's that's not it at all like that's just not the project 
I'm not, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not here to carry you away to other worlds or whatever. <laughs> no, and I, and I actually, I mean, um, I don't think you do. Like, I, I feel like there are these little poison darts that, that are hidden that will eventually sort of do their work, if not immediately. But I was really struck, actually, just like in it, just even that exchange that we had about how much um, the response reminds me of Ava's response when she doesn't see things. You know, she's 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 not mean about it, right? There's there's even kind of like a charming sort of um, sort of a charming like dismissal, I guess, right? That that I guess is almost worse than if she's working at it, right? And so. Um, mm. Yeah, so I was just, I was thinking about it, and I was also thinking, actually, when I, I don't know if I've told you, but when I wrote my first book, I was really irritated with the hardcover, um, not my first book, my second book, because, um, you know, in a book that has so much about, like, the erasure of women from their own stories, the cover had, like, images from all these different things that happened, but were not at all about, like, the actual story, and so, like, so I was thinking about how sometimes um, the thing that you're trying to write against or about ends, ends up... Um, landing in a way that like it replicates the thing you know like the thing that you're trying to which is I think can be very frustrating um okay I think that I am getting notes that I have been talking to you um okay. I've been I've been monopolizing you and so we can move to questions from the audience I hope that you forgive me for bringing up the idea of magic but um but I, I couldn't help I couldn't help myself and um and I was thinking about it so oh see Aren't you glad that I, that I did this? We can skip the questions about magic. Mm -hmm. um, oh, somebody says, I love what is yours is not yours. How do you determine whether a story will be short or a novel? Have you ever wanted to go back and extend a short story you'd previously left? And can I add one more question um, to this very wonderful question? Did the characters from your stories and your books like ever hang out in your mind? Like, do they cross? Do they cross stories? Um, mm. Rarely, rarely. Like, I think I think about iPad and Taylor a lot, actually, from pieces. But aside from that, uh, <laughs> I don't know why I think about them so much. But aside from that, no. But with um, with what is not yours is not yours. I still I love that book so much. I feel like it's my best book, um, and it makes me very happy. But there was one story about puppeteers that I almost wanted to make a novel on, or a novella but it was actually it was sort of breaking my mind and so I sort of wrote it for as long as I was able to and then I just sort of dropped it like it was yeah it became it became like holding a very hot coal like the, there was so much on the surface and also beneath the surface of that story that I just couldn't sustain it for for longer than it already was um, but I think that 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 was a story I would have loved to spend more time in more time in but I just didn't have the mental frequency for it um so how do I know I with each one I just sort of write to my limit with each of the short stories I just wrote to my limit and then when I couldn't do any more I stopped how about you how was your experience of writing the anonymous sex story by the way oh, Which I'm, so I feel like that's going to be the first one I identify when we get the anthology we wrote for this anthology called anonymous sex where everyone writes a sex story but our names won't be on the stories. And I'm like, can't wait to identify Kathy's. I can't wait to identify yours. You've told me like three things. Actually, you've told me one thing about it, um, which what is that it got you? crazier. You told me it got crazier and crazier. Um, oh yeah, but that's, <laughs> I feel like most of the stories will be like that. So I'll be safely hidden. <laughs> they'll get crazier and crazier. I think you'll, <laughs> yes. I think you'll identify mine fairly easily. Um, mm -hmm but I'm not sure. What was my experience of writing that story? Oh, it was so hard, Helen, because as I told you, I, I just haven't had thoughts um, in years, um, and particularly through the pandemic. And, um, and I haven't written actually very much um, because mm. childcare and like, very, you know, like housework, all this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But it was fun to write. Did you have fun writing your anonymous sex story? It was, I think the anonymity helped and then it made me wish that I, I thought I've been sort of thinking maybe I'll write everything anonymously for the rest of my life um pseudonyms you know, would like, be good no I but weirdly I think the, anon the anonymity made me anxious I thought that it would be freeing but I felt like I was trying to cover up my tracks all the time and uh, like not do the things that 
that might identify me or like not do the things that came naturally to me because then they would show or something I don't know it was weird yeah yeah maybe I was Um, I was probably overthinking it you have like a larger body of work and like many fans and so so I think that I could rely on my anonymity I think a little more reliably than than you can but I um you know actually I think that it made me feel free because I felt sort of free of expectations in a certain way and um mm. And maybe, you know, like that story has almost no identifiers except, gen- you know, like the gender of certain people doing things. Um, but mm-hmm. other- otherwise, it's, okay, I don't want to actually tell you too much because it'll make it easier mm-hmm. for you to. I was hoping to, that you'd um, drop a clue, but no. <laughs> yes, I know. I, I'm on to you. But um, yeah, it was, it was interesting. And it was interesting also to write something on assignment, which I hardly ever do, you know, to have a subject, which was sex, and then to figure out how I wanted to approach it. And it became for me, and I'm not sure if it's like this for you when you write, but but this particular story became for me a question of like structure. Um, Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In what way? Then, does that, you know, I mean, does, does, this reflect, know does this reflect how you feel about sex or how you feel about what is sexy? Like, is there a structural <laughs> element to that or was it? Or I think, I, it like, made, I, think I needed, I think I needed a structure to figure out my take on sex. Yeah. Like I mean, I needed like a mental framework, you know, like to mm-hmm. figure out. Yeah. And, and then I needed to kind of like build it into the story. I feel like I'm revealing a lot more and, and you haven't hmm. revealed anything. So hmm. I'm going to stop now and read another question. Um, <laughs> I love, is your blood as red as this? And I'm intrigued to learn there are more puppets in your new book. Can you talk about your interest and inspiration with puppets? Does this connect to the culture in Prague? Yes, Prague has so many excellent puppeteers and ah. Uh... Yeah, I'm just just thinking about puppets and how I went to this wonderful puppet show that it must have been a couple of summers ago. Um, it was without words entirely. And also it was, um, there was an improvisational element. So you had these two absolute genius puppeteers that were just letting the puppets interact in ways that, it, and it kind of sounds like it would be so aimless, but it was, it was so perfectly diamond sharp intense like these encounters between objects that were more than objects in some way and the ways that they wanted to navigate some of them wanted to fight some of them wanted to love some of them wanted to like create alliances against other against other objects and it was just very I think it was about an hour and a half long but it also it felt like a day and also like five minutes like there was something and I think that that's puppet time for you like it's just it's very compressed um but no, they aren't really puppets and pieces. It was just, um, so Otto is a hypnotist and he was trying to find something that's like akin to um, hypnotism. And I think he just settled on the marionette show as that, as that analog of um, mesmerism. But yeah, puppets. And as to how I came across them for What Is Not Yours, it's actually a book about keys, but I think at some point I got stuck on keys and then I started reading this book Called Puppets by Kenneth Gross and I would recommend anything by Kenneth Gross he just writes I don't I don't really know how to explain what he does but um whatever he does is just vital and like makes your brain explode in in various areas he writes about dolls he writes about puppets he writes about statues he writes about things that simulate life or that we we try to force to simulate life and um the kind of strange atmospheres that emanate from that um but he's also got a book out this year called dangerous children about um children and stories that are either endangered or endanger you as you try to follow them into like their their past so he writes about alice he writes about pinocchio he writes about peter pan but it's all all of his readings are things that just would never have occurred to me, but like make perfect sense when he says it. Um, anyway, I think Ken Gross is a genius. He wrote a book called Puppet, which I would highly recommend. And that was what got me started on my puppet story and what is now yours. Um, what other books or authors do you see pieces being in conversation with? Um, I was thinking a lot about Zan Shui and um, Love in the New Millennium and The Last Lover. 
and the way that there are these relationships between the characters that the characters themselves have no control over. It's just very, it's almost as if once a relationship starts, like that's it, it's like written and it can never be erased or undone. And then the relationship just takes on its own momentum and the people try to get out of the relationship and they can't, like they move across the world from each other and the relationship drags them back. Um, especially in The Last Lover, there's a father and son and um, the father would say that he's not close to his son, but the son is like, no, we are close. And the father tries to, escape his family by going into a book and the son just like follows him <laughs> this is this very dogged pursuit of um who knows what but just a bond um and a, and an assertion of that bond so it kind of made me think if I wanted to write a breakup story where someone didn't accept the breakup like what are the ways that the relationship could um sort of elongate and draw other people into its proximity and then like drag everyone onto a train and what kind of revenge could be enacted there and and so on. So I was thinking very much of relationships in a in a Zan Shui sense. Um, and also Jung and how he talks about archetypes and how two people in a relationship can have a completely disastrous relationship and just like walk away from it and think what happened there <laughs> and just have no idea like why they were so awful to each other. And his argument is that there are like some there are some traces or some elements that we hold on to that like force us into a kind of role play that we're not even aware of that like the other person specifically brings out of us. And so those two elements just like clash. And then when you separate, you forget all about it and you are like, who even was that person? Um, so the sense of like the disappearing boyfriend or the disappearing girlfriend um, <laughs> that you don't carry over into the next relationship. Um, so Jung, Zan Shui, uh, I love Tokai Jok, right, and the way she she writes about moving across space um, in flight. And yeah, that was pretty much it. Um, what are your current loves and inspirations, literature, poetry, film, etc.? Uh, thank you so much. You are one of my favorite authors, and I feel so lucky to hear you speak today. Thank you, thank you. That makes that makes writing worth it. <laughs> um, I don't know if I, I want to say that I'm inspired by film. Like I love um, the, the, a film that I saw recently that I loved, loved, loved. Um, Portrait of a Lady on Fire. I just was obsessed with that film. I think I must have watched it like three or four times. Like everybody else, I loved Parasite. I, I, I feel like Parasite actually kind of depressed me a little bit and it's sort of like, what is the point? <laughs> because this film does all of the it does all of the stuff that a story should do and so do I need to keep trying <laughs> I mean it had it had the societal layer it had psychological layers to it just like visually it was just gorgeous every minute of it felt like a novel in and of itself and so it was just sort of like, huh. um so maybe film and things like that are more demoralizing than I don't know what do you do you get tend to get inspired or more demoralized by by the stuff that you take in, by the culture you consume? Um, it really depends. Um, never by things that I didn't see coming. Do you know what I mean? It's, I think it's when somebody tries, or somebody like really succeeds at doing something that, I, that I've felt was like impossible, you know, like that it's like, I'm always reaching for this thing, but like never get within um, kind of swatting distance. I get irritated when I'm like, oh, I guess, I guess it is possible and this person just did it. But I, but I think um, when I see things or read things that like I didn't even see coming, you know, that just kind of like open up a part of your mind that you didn't even know was closed. Like that's my favorite. Then I, then I'm just like very excited. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I'm, I am too. But I think, I think it's excitement mixed with wistfulness. <laughs> yeah, yeah um for sure for sure but yes I, I think for sure I have I have wistfulness too I'm always like why why can't I be as charming and and brilliant as my friend Helen oh yeah yummy um but uh, I know I know I, I mustn't I mustn't okay uh two more questions before we run out of time um what brings Helen to the stuff in her books that most people aren't seeing is there a source or experience that taught her about it? How does she decide what the boundaries are and what's too much? Um, the, stuff, the stuff in my books that people aren't seeing. Um, could there be an elaboration on that question? Is that? 
Um, I think that that stuff that people aren't seeing was actually meant to um, amend an earlier question about magic. Oh, think? that, well, I, um, well, it's just all of the, because I think that the things that I'm doing are actually like very simple. So I don't, I don't feel like it's a special like vision that I have or it's it, the, the quest is to tell stories about stories right and eventually hopefully find out what stories are made of like it's that simple and so all sorts of like strange things happen because the stories know that their stories are like that's that's why the strange things happen and so rather than the whole magic thing it's more kind of it's it's to do with form it's to do with um an internal awareness of like the logic of a story and um a desire to kind of provoke some sort of reaction from the order of the story it's like it's like the conversation between the anarchist poet and the poet of order where it's like what will come out if you if you do this provocation to the story if you make it stranger and stranger what will emerge from that will the story assert itself and say okay this is what I am or not um has the pandemic impacted your writing process or your understanding or relationship to your work um, hmm. I don't think so. Like, not that I've noticed so far, but then I think it, it takes a while to observe what's changing. Like, I'm about to start writing again. So June 1st is my, is my hard deadline for, like, disappearing back into the book writing cave. And so I guess we will see. When is your deadline? June 1st? in first I'm gone after that Kathy like don't bother trying to contact me or anything <laughs> what if there's an emergency um Helen just so everyone knows disappears when she's writing she'll send you kind of a goodbye text of see ya and then um, if there's an emergency then obviously <laughs> yes I do feel like you've occasionally broken your disappearance with brief texts that are like don't text me back but <laughs> um but yes um and Thank how you long your do your answer. how long do your disappearances last um so I've worked it out so that I write half of the book and then I take a break of about a month so I'll probably be like chasing you a lot like when, when I'm taking my break but and then I go back and do the other half um so maybe I feel like this will be three or four months that I'll be gone I miss you um last question how does your um background inform your viewpoint the question is nigerian background but i'm actually just curious like does moving around um as much as you have like does prague like living in prague versus living in berlin versus living in paris versus living in toronto you know like are there ways that your like your environment seeps in um um not really I feel like the life of a British person living in Prague is just you know standard um mm -hmm. so there's not much that I would be able to and especially when you look at the kind of stories I write like there's not much that would inspire the other but um and also I think that wherever I am I would just write the way that I write mostly because I write based on what I read like it's a reaction to what I read like I was talking about Zhang Shui and, and Jung and Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. how I want to have conversations with the books that I've read um, rather than rather than try to um, speak from again what even is background like I don't know yeah I wondered if you were like taking a lot more trains or if like the, the Czech language uh, seeps in or if there are just like movies that you see because you're there mm -hmm. um, um, yeah I am well I always like I always like to take trains um you know, in America, we don't we don't do the train journey as as much or as romantically. I think. Um, no, when not, but oh, it takes so long. Like I remember, I wanted to visit Abraham Lincoln's house when I was when I was doing the residency at Kentucky, and it took so long. It took as long as it would take to cross like three European countries. <laughs> I feel like to get to to get just across one state because after that, I was going yeah. to visit Nami in um, Chicago. It's just so long, but also. It was kind. Of, it was a beautiful train trip, actually. I feel like when I think of beauteous expanses, I don't necessarily think America, but that's that's actually incorrect. 
Um, so it's time to wrap up. I will say there's a little bit of shade thrown um, about a train trip in America. Uh, so for people who haven't read the book yet, uh, who are in America, you can you can look out for it. Um, thank you so much, Helen, for this conversation. Um, and to everybody who attended and to the Loft members who make these events possible and to the co-sponsors, St. Catherine University and Star Tribune. This event is co-presented by Literary Arts in Portland, Oregon, Black Mountain Institute in Las Vegas, Nevada, and Wisconsin Book Festival in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and before we go, a quick reminder to please, 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 um, please fill out the evaluation, which will be coming to your inbox if it's not already there, and to go and buy Helen's book. Um, and thank you again for joining us.